on the on the library's website, the Friends of the Library website, and also with the Historical Society. It's my pleasure to introduce Karen Albertson, the Executive Director of the Hollywood Historical Society. Karen? Thank you, Hannah. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure today to introduce Jeff Rusnick, who has served as Director of Development at the Arts and Culture Center, Hollywood since 2008, focusing primary, primarily on grant writing. I might wanna hire you, Jeff. Mm -hmm. During this tenure, the center has received numerous grants from such foundations as the John S. and James L. Knight Foundation, the National Endowment for the Arts and Community Foundation of Broward County, as well as numerous awards from family foundations and the government. If you haven't been to the Arts and Culture Center, please do yourself a favor. It's an absolutely marvelous place to see, and hopefully it'll be up and running fully soon. Uh, Jeff recently authored a novel and a historic play and is seeking a publisher for each. So if there's any publishers out there, I can give you his number. He met his wife in downtown Hollywood, and they live in Plantation with with their two daughters. And now I'd like to introduce Jeff Rusnick. Go ahead, Jeff. Thank you very much, Karen, and thank you, Hannah, and um, welcome to everybody. And thank you all for, for being with us today and for, um, for taking an interest in the Art and Culture Center of Hollywood. We, we're big admirers of what the Historical Society of Hollywood does. It's, it's really critical to, um, to any, any city uh, to keep a record of things and that that memory gets gets shared and passed along, because uh, as we as we as I mentioned in my uh, in my play that you alluded to, Karen, uh, one of my characters says is if all you do is forget, is how can you learn anything? So to me, the the way we, we remember uh, and and uh, and and remember using memory also to move and and make progress as well. So that's what I believe we try to do at the, the Art and Culture Center. Uh, so thank you all. I wanna just uh, do a shout out real quick to uh, our executive director, Joyce Satterley, who uh, hired me back in 2008. And uh, the successes uh, we have at the center, many of you know Joy, I'm sure. Uh, really, I attribute to uh, her leadership and um, hiring quality people and uh, finding a way to keep them on. I didn't expect I would be here for uh, what going on 14 years now, but uh, it's it's been a great place to work. and. And as you alluded to, Karen, I met my wife in Hollywood and it's uh, used to play in the uh, housing uh, when Emerald Hills was being built. We had family friends and we'd go visit and we'd go running around through the houses as they were being built. So I uh, used to go to the Hollywood Mall way back when it was uh, built, take the bus from Plantation. So Hollywood's been, for me, really a second city and and um, and now it's one in one A since I spend about as much time in Hollywood almost as I do at home in Plantation. So. Um, so today we're gonna to do, I have a, um, a PowerPoint um, that basically is three parts and it's gonna be uh, pretty much how we, um, how we started as an organization, uh, a little bit of been a transition into how we moved into our current facility at 1650 Harrison Street. And then we'll just bring you right up to date into things that are happening currently. Uh, be impossible to cover all 45 years in thorough detail. And I, and I know we, we can't indulge everybody's time. Uh, we did publish a booklet back in 2015 uh, based on the first 40 years of the organization. And we'll be looking to update that as we approach our 50th anniversary, which will be coming up in 2025. And we rely on the Historical Society a lot for archival information and just getting the details right. So I am going to do, I don't do this very often, but I've been practicing with Hannah so I'm going to do a screen share and I hit that button and that button and you should be seeing a page that says 1975 to 2015 celebrating 40 years. Okay, so this was uh, basically the, um, the promotional card or the that we used to um, have a celebration at the galleries on October 25th, 2015 and it was also used as the cover for the uh, for the publication that we spoke about. Um, and that captured from our founding back um, and opening in 1975 uh, up through 2015. So we are going to really use this booklet as a guide for about the first half or so of our presentation. And let's go here to where we started. 
So I was just speaking, uh, getting clarification from Karen. We were at 1301 South Ocean Drive. This used to be a, um, a condo sales center that had gone vacant. And um, at the time, there basically the Hollywood, the, the beach area particularly was a lot of retirees from the North who were really hungry to have, a, um, have an arts facility. And this became identified uh, really as the, the space. Uh, what's distinct about it is notice the glass facade. Most arts organizations, uh, <laughs> visual arts organizations don't, aren't uh, framed by glass because you're trying to keep the sun off the artworks. But it, it, was, the, it, was, a, it was available and the city was generous enough to make it um, available and saw the value and creating the art and culture center. So um, as I was as just with Karen, this is the space by the way, that is coming under controversy for I guess a new office tower that is being discussed. So there's a lot of history in this space and the art and culture center um, is a big part of that. So our opening day um, in uh, 1975, we had about 2000 people paid $5 a head to get in and uh, that was probably the biggest fundraising day outside of getting support from the city. We were, uh, the Art and Culture Center was basically under the city's management at the time. Um, so we opened on, um, on uh, in, in 75 with about 2000 people, uh, obviously an older audience. And as, as we know, um, Hollywood and South Florida at that time was, um, was a place where people came to, to retire. And, uh, and, and one of the things that uh, the people who came a lot from the Northeast came is, is to leave something behind and that these are the individuals, many of them who are responsible for, for creating the Art and Culture Center. If you notice behind the flags hanging up there, uh, we were just on the cusp of the bicentennial. So that's, uh, that's how far that was. Um, so the, really the woman who we look at as the sort of the material and spiritual founder of the Art and Culture Center who, who really spearheaded the initial effort was, um, was our first board chair, Eleanor Magee. And uh, she moved here from Philadelphia and uh, she had helped operate the Seven Lively Arts Festival which operated from 1960 to 1975. She got in the, in the ear of the commission and just pushed and pushed and pushed until either they got tired of hearing it or they saw the wisdom, probably a combination of both. But really, uh, Mrs. Magee is, um, you know, in our history, she's the, she's the one who, who made us uh, most possible in terms of really seeing that a, a city without art and culture um, does not have really a, a, the distinctive quality of uh, attracting visitors, of, of, of giving uh, education spaces, and, um, and really just enriching the, the health and well-being of, of, of individuals in the city. So that's the ribbon cutting with uh, Mayor David Keating. And um, so the events of that first day, and as you, you can see a little bit from this, um, this docket of activities, um, there were a lot of organizations at the time who didn't have a home, they didn't have a facility. And the Art and Culture Center gave a, a, a space where art had a home. Uh, so that day we had the Broward County Civic Ballet no longer in business. Um, Hollywood Philharmonic, uh, the ensemble that day, no longer around, the Arts and Crafts Guild, maybe somebody knows somebody, if are, I don't know. So all of these have uh, the Tuesday morning music hall and a music salon. So this was uh, the opening day and it was really just a celebration of, I think the arts as um, having arrived in Hollywood, not just as a visual arts entity uh, with the Art and Culture Center, but really also with, um, with giving a home to places that needed a space. And there's Ms. Maggie. And uh, so this is, you probably have copies of this magazine, Town Topics, somewhere in the Historical Society, uh, 65 cents, um, probably a full color glossy at the time. And um, as I'd mentioned, um, Mrs. Maggie was part of the Seven Lively Arts Festival, which was a one week event that happened in Young Circle. And this really was the, the beginning of of what the Art and Culture Center eventually became. Um, from 1960 to 1975, the population of Hollywood tripled. And that really gave the, the foundation of a taxpayer base, a community base, and sort of gave Hollywood a um, really a place in South Florida, um, along with Fort Lauderdale and in Miami as sort of major, major destination spaces. 
So anyone who was living here at the time, um, the term cultural wasteland was um, pretty commonly uh, thrown around. I was, I'm a native here and I moved away twice. And one of my sort of, I guess, feelings of absence in growing up here was we didn't really have culture. Um, kind of had movies, some art cinemas were opening around at the time, but there really wasn't venues. And uh, so Mrs. Maggie, uh, she didn't say it was a cultural wasteland. She said it lacks any cultural facilities whatsoever. And um, since that time, when you think about how South Florida has changed, to me, the most dramatic change uh, besides the being a magnet for people from all around the world uh, is that we now have facilities in Pompano. Fort Lauderdale has a great museum. The Broward Center has come online. Miramar, Pompano that I mentioned. Uh, um, Pembroke Pines, just in Broward County, Sunrise all have cultural facilities. We've seen what's happened in Miami with Art Basel, um, the Institute of Contemporary Art, and uh, the Bass Museum expanding. And I, I think that, to me, signals the maturity of South Florida. And the Art and Culture Center has has really been a part of that. And um, we we track our growth along with all these other organizations that have come online uh, over the years. And and I think it's made um, I speak to my wife, we're getting closer to retirement, where would we go? And I don't really feel the need to leave uh, any longer the way I maybe I once did. So um, again, I'll just to repeat, we were um, at the home site for the Hollywood Philharmonic, uh, which are very expensive to operate. And there's very few uh, symphonies any longer down here, Hollywood Art Guild. The Hollywood South Florida Poetry Festival, I think there is a poetry group that is an offshoot from that original run by a gentleman named Lenny Della Rocca. So I think that sort of survived in other forms. Um, and then the South Florida Art Institute of Hollywood, which I'm not familiar with. One of the things that did operate in the facility was an artist named Elwood Porter. He was originally from North Carolina and he operated an art school in the facility. And a lot of artists who eventually became uh, practicing artists in South Florida uh, studied under, under Elwood at this site. Um, big step for us, 1978 uh, be became a nonprofit, and that's when you really start to take on the mantle of raising funds and, uh, and starting to build your organization out from there. We are a 501c3 now, have been since August 31st, 1978. And uh, so we, um, the term nonprofit is you're not out there to make money, but if you don't have money, you can't stay open. So between Joy uh, and myself and our program and uh, directors, uh, we work every day to make sure that we're, we're responsible to, to, uh, to the funders that, that give us money and that we retain those funders. And we've been very successful at that um, at, during my time for sure. Um, so in the course of an organization, we always have in, uh, individuals who make a big, big difference. And Wendy Blazer would have been Outside of Eleanor Maggie helping us found uh, the, the Art and Culture Center, Wendy was really the first curator of note. And she came on in 1979 as a Hollywood native, uh, went to Florida State, studied um, art history there and, and uh, museum um, operations. And um, Wendy at the time uh, really, I think, was probably among the two or three leading curators here. So the center was really fortunate. And, and the center, I think besides her, maybe had one other front of house person, but she more or less was the staff uh, for a number of years. And, um, and she just had a grasp of local art and also bringing in shows nationally. So among those, here's just an example, uh, 90 Prints by Henry Matisse. Through the years, the early years, artists like Picasso, Robert Rauschenberg, um, were on, didn't have big shows, but they were, their works were featured. The thing I think the center is really known for now and, and Wendy was very good at was picking out sort of that thing that nobody else had thought of. And uh, so this is a show called The Courtroom Art of Shirley Henderson and pictured here is Alcee Hastings. And this is a drawing of him from a federal trial in 1984. He was, he was acquitted at trial and uh, came to the opening night of the uh, of the reception, but that was I think uh, I was in a uh, back then part of an or, uh, an exhibition of Haitian art at the time, and you always felt like the Art and Culture Center was really on the the front edge of um, of doing what was new and what was current in the moment. Um, another big development, 1982, uh, the center had been free admission from 75 up till 82. So we uh, started charging $1 admission for adults and 50 cents for children. 
Um, we're probably, if you did a cost of living um, compared to then and now, we're probably not too much more expensive. We're at $7 adults now, uh, $4 for youth and members of course are free. So after a while, the um, really the condo sales building that became a, a, a hub for, for the arts and the home of the art and culture center had kind of started to outlive its, um, its lifespan. The, the uh, building, it was determined needed $300,000 in repairs. And uh, it was also, I think, isolated from a, the large, large part of the population in Hollywood. And I think there was a sense that the opportunity, the time had come to really start to look for another location to be in the downtown area um, where it could be a, a, a hub for the neighborhood and for downtown businesses and attracting uh, visitors downtown. Um, by the time, uh, this was in 1985, that uh, this, uh, in 86 actually, uh, there was an election. So by that time we had 1200 members, 35 concerts every year, um, education for children and attracting a, lot, a big audience for our visual arts. So the center was well established and really ready to graduate from that, um, that original space into a more permanent home. Uh, Mara Galanti was the, uh, the mayor at the time and um, Mara uh, at a rally to try and get uh, the support in a, uh, in a referendum. Businesses wanna be where there's activity, where there's community pride and where there's culture. And, and this is one of the things in our fundraising we talk about a lot is uh, cultural organizations um, really are a big part of how cities identify and how they, uh, how they keep residents and attract new residents. As it turns out, uh, the initiative failed. And this was really the beginning of what became kind of a near death uh, spiral for the Art and Culture Center around um, when this referendum failed in 86. Um, it was determined to close the center until a new site could be identified. And, um, and it really became at that point fighting just to keep it open. You know, once you lose something, it's hard to get back. So at the time, uh, David Horvitz, who was still a supporter of ours and a gentleman named Al Finch, um, went out on a fundraising campaign to raise $50,000 to do the minimum repairs that would keep the uh, 1301 South Ocean site open until we could um, identify a new site. So around that time, the um, Kagan home, which we're in now, which was a Dunson uh, Foster funeral home um, had been vacated and that was available. This is a 1924 aerial photo of uh, Hollywood looking east and the arrow pointing to the Kagi home. Uh, aerial photo courtesy of the Hollywood Historical Society. Thank you very much. And um, so really this became a consensus choice because it had the, the, um, the Spanish Mediterranean revival architecture and at that time, I thought when Miami built their new museum in downtown, they were kind of that, that Spanish uh, Mediterranean look was sort of making a little bit of a comeback around the time. So it fit, fit the moment. And more than anything, the space was available. So the city, um, the city purchased it. Um, the home originally was built in 1924. Uh, Jack Kagey, who uh, worked for Joseph Young, paid, um, it was built for 16,000 and actually, Jack Kagey had a choice. He could either get two cars or a home, courtesy of Joseph Young. Uh, he took the home. So there's the original sighting of it and, uh, and its location in the neighborhood. You can see the street grid uh, for the neighborhood was well in place. And you know, when you think back and the historical society lives us every day, the, what the vision of Joseph Young and where the city was so, so quickly in its early founding uh, is pretty astounding actually. And um, things were going, really smoothly at uh, I think 20,000 residents in the city at the time. And then very famously, the uh, 1926 hurricane came in and uh, sort of like the man with no name who comes to town and everything changes uh, by the time he leaves. Uh, this is the corner of Dixie Highway and Arthur Street. Uh, population dropped to 2000 and uh, the Kagey family was among those uh, who left. So we went then through in, in the history of the building, um, through a series of occupants and owners. Uh, the one we talk about at the center, because it's actually kind of col colorful and you get this great graphic out of it, was that somebody who was a manufacturer and industrialist for the Brillo company uh, lived there. Um, I have since gotten a much more comprehensive list. Uh, thank you to uh, Joan Michelson, who uh, I reached out to 
earlier this year, there's actually, when you go to Broward County property, uh, it lists the, um, the start date of the Kagi home in 1935. And we know that's not, not true. So we don't know exactly why that is maybe there was um, maybe some additions were done to the home. Maybe the address didn't comport. Um, either way, uh, Joan um, did the did the uh, the background work for us, and here are sort of the various iterations of the house. Uh, insurance business. Uh, R. T. Miller owned it in '33. There was the Brillo pads. Um, the we think the wife of Earl popped out. who has a very nice um, athletic facility named for him. A gentleman named Harry. Harder bought it for 20,000. Jones, not sure whether it was this facility or maybe a downtown building and so on. The uh, Edward uh, and uh, T and Peg Foster acquired the home in 53. Uh, the funeral home became the LB Johnson funeral home in um, uh, 60 and then the Foster, Johnson Foster. Um, we opened in February of 1992 and uh, we do have a plaque on our building uh, courtesy of the Hollywood Historical Society. Um, that uh, captures what we think will be um, a lasting uh, occupant. We've been there now for uh, since 92. Uh, this was the building uh, just before. And um, you, what you'll notice here is that there is no gallery to the uh, left side of the photo, which would be the east side. Uh, that was added on by, by the funeral home. So um, the city uh, paid for the space. The city put the money up to, um, to renovate it into an arts facility. And in um, 1992, we moved in. This is uh, the move to the Kagi Mansion began in the summer of 91. And this is the funeral home taking out um, some of its furnishings and appropriately putting it into a hearse, signaling the burial of, uh, of that part of the history. Coinciding at the time, the beach location had stayed open. So um, we were able to continue to keep our doors open, continue to fundraise, continue to, to get donors um, and to stay present, which I think was critical for the Kagi space happening as quickly as it did. Uh, beach location closed on November 3rd, 1991, which is almost to the day, 16 years of, um, of the original opening, final exhibition, Neath Nevelson, and uh, an example of, uh, of the work that was being shown. Um, so opening day, February 2nd, 1992, and uh, the building more or less from the outside looks pretty much a lot like it did back then, been painted, been spruced up, the roof and so on, but, but the way that we operate as a facility has not changed dramatically. Um, and on opening day, we use the parking lot, which occasionally we will do for fundraisers on the, um, on the side where 17th Street is. And, um, Opening exhibition on the uh, the first day was um, called "As Seen by Both Sides," uh, curated by, um, by by Wendy, and uh, this was an exhibition of eighty three works by twenty American and twenty Vietnamese artists. So, um, what? And I'll bring you up to date here um, in a, in a second. Now, let's do this real first. Uh, first, uh, so the first founders of the Kegi. Mansion facility, Johnny Sue and George Glantz still living in Hollywood. Johnny Sue is an honorary board member. Francie Bishop Good and David Horvitz, major funders for us, consistent funders for us through the years. Francie's an artist, operates Girls Club. She was a Hollywood uh, native growing up. David's family, uh, he grew up in Hollywood. Uh, Leonard and Sally Robbins. Leonard has passed in 2013. Sally Robbins is uh, on our honorary board. Uh, Becker Polykoff, we have a, um, had really almost our board of trustees has had someone from, from the, uh, the firm, which is now known as Becker, uh, has been on our board pretty much since that time. Uh, William and Norma Horvitz, really the, probably as responsible as anybody for the building out of Hollywood um, and building home sites through the years. And then the uh, Einstein Fund, which um, they're operating up somewhere in Vero Beach, I think. And uh, we reached out for funding a little while ago and um, they're not giving the way, they, the way they once did. So, so we were established there and um, I'm gonna sort of, we're not gonna go year by year. I did wanna bring us up to date on to how we got to the Kegi home. So we're gonna skip next to something if you were all here at the time, you'll remember very well, which was Ocean Dance, which uh, Ocean Dance started in 1999 to 2009. Uh, the last Ocean Dance ended with the, the um, economic crisis that kicked in in 2008. And it just depleted um, funding for in, in public and private spheres. So it just became 
um, just not financially viable really uh, for the city to continue to fund it. And um, we made efforts at the time to try to, to bring it back, maybe at a different time of year where it might not be as expensive, but you have turtle season. Getting the beach is actually very, very hard for big events because you're competing with so many, so many other things. Um, but this was a real, um, this coincided as well with the center becoming a performing arts organization in addition to the visual arts. So we're gonna bring it up to date to now. So this is a shot of our gallery from our most recent uh, show, uh, our summer show, I should say, called Artists and Identity, Portraiture, Performance, Doppelgangers and Disguise. This featured 13 national and local artists, including Cindy Sherman, well-known artist and Andy Leibowitz. So what the gallery you're looking at was added on to the original Kagi home. And, uh, and it was a chapel for the funeral home um, up until the center moving in. And, and you can see kind of on the flooring, the flooring is uh, pretty much, you can see the markings on the flooring where maybe the chapel out, the outline of where the chapel and the, the uh, funeral home was, was designed. So we do about five major exhibitions, um, group exhibitions in this space every year. And, um, and rather than bringing in touring shows, everything is originally curated. It's one of the things that makes us distinct. Our curator, Megan Kent, uh, very talented, and um, so she goes out and she gives space for uh, artists, many of whom are really just at the beginning of getting recognition and getting space uh, to, to exhibit. This is from the opening for Artists and Identity. Uh, we did a um, shadow puppet performance by the artist Christina Peterson, who's speaking to the audience there. Just an FYI, we, we closed down with COVID. We did reopen in June of 2020, very little gallery traffic. Um, but we were being funded and we didn't want to, we didn't want to lose our funding. So we did open, ob observing all the protocols. We've seen really when the vaccinations kicked in, we've seen audience return. We're seeing more audience than we did in, a year ago, but I just think, you know, we're all in the same space of just trying to, you know, get past this, this moment where it's just taken, we, we're taking longer than we think. We plan that the art and cover, you know, in three months, it ought to be, <laughs> we ought to be further along and maybe we'll be able to do this. And we've been sort of making that, that argument now for, for about six or eight months. Um, one of the things we take a lot, a lot of pride in is, like I mentioned before, giving um, South Florida artists, particularly that first place where they, uh, they get you know, exposure through the entire region. This is um, currently in gallery two at the Art and Culture Center, an artist named Mark Florida, or Mark is 25. And um, we believe uh, this is his first solo exhibition in South Florida. We believe Mark is a unique talent. Uh, he's of Haitian descent. He's never been to Haiti. His parents are from Haiti. Um, he works in textiles, painting, uh, printmaking, and um, he's, this is being done with uh, Ulite Arts in Miami Beach. We do a lot of partnerships. Virtually all our gallery exhibitions are funded um, in some outside way. We don't do a ton in terms of gallery admissions the way you might at the Met in New York or, or uh, the Perez. So we really depend on our funders to, to help support that. We exhibit about 125 South Florida artists uh, each year and typically we'll have an artist talk. Uh, Mark, uh, with, with each show, Mark is doing a virtual uh, Facebook Live uh, this Saturday at 6 p.m. if you'd like to join in. Uh, upstairs, our community gallery, we use this for, I think Susan Ostheim is on this call. And I saw Susan and Susan has been exhibiting in there for as long as uh, with her South Broward students for as long as I've been there. And, it is really for, for us, the high point of the community gallery season is to see uh, her National Honor Society students meeting in, the, in there and seeing the art of, of her students and the work that she's done. I know she's retired, but she's a champion right there. Congratulations and thank you. This is a show from 2020 that uh, was done in memory of the, um, of the school shooting at Douglas High School. Um, so we, we did, uh, these are works that recognize that event. We exhibit about more than 300 K through 12 students in a given year, in addition to South Broward, uh, Hollywood Hills Elementary, uh, Ben Gamla, Avant Guard Charter, uh, Beachside Montessori and others in Hollywood um, have exhibited with us or do on a regular basis. Uh, if you're driving past Harrison, I'm sure you recognize this little space here. This is where we uh, do art classes, visual art classes. Um, 
it's really just a, a cottage that was built in maybe 1955-ish, I think. Uh, one bedroom cottage, which has been, uh, was retrofitted into uh, a teaching space um, back in 1993 when we moved in. In the middle there is uh, Alley Gator, and uh, that's on permanent exhibit, and that's an artwork that was created um, at a, in a partnership we did with um, at Sawgrass Mills, a public art project uh, promoting uh, their work, and we were able to get an artist and then bring the work back uh, to the Art and Culture Center. Um, this is the inside of the building, very modest, and um, this would be something as we go forward, we would uh, find this very valuable space and would love to continue to upgrade it, uh, funding uh, allowed. Um, we operate a third facility, the Hollywood Central Performing Arts Center. Since 1997, uh, we moved in there after it was built by Broward Schools. It's a complicated sort of thing. It's a Broward Schools uh, property at the Hollywood Central Elementary. It's managed really by the city and the city contracts with us to make sure that it's actually used. And uh, we do about 75 program dates a year and in excess of about 100 dates also of uh, rentals from outside arts organizations and community groups and school assemblies. So in a non-COVID year, a pre-COVID year, I should say, we're probably bringing between 30 and 35 people go into the space every year. And, um, and it's just been in a shutdown mode. It's, it's closed currently. And uh, we are waiting for the reopening, um, hopefully here in the next, um, within the next month uh, or sooner, the sooner the better, because we're getting a lot of calls of uh, people who want to use the building. So this summer, thanks to um, a relationship, really great relationship with the city of Hollywood, which is enormously supportive of us and values what we do, we had to move our summer camp to Arts Park at Young Circle. So every year we do a nine week summer camp of, um, of uh, acting and, uh, and visual arts, performance and visual, visual arts. And we're able to be at the Arts Park Amphitheater for the first time ever. And this is a shot from our show Into the Woods. And uh, we were, uh, it's a little hot in July, in August uh, to be out there at the park, but uh, we, were, we were grateful to have a space where we did not lose two years of programming really. We did it last year, but with the first year of COVID. And then this year we built the numbers a little bit. And our goal is just to stay active, stay in, stay in the public eye. And then as we get out of this, this period we're in is to, um, is to be, be ready to go full bore. Uh, so the, this is from our Broadway actors and the uh, um, Into the Woods performance. And we go as young as eight up to um, as high as 18 uh, for students in that show. And this um, we feel is, really critical to our mission, which is um, to build creativity and innovation and uh, in the community. Um, it's really giving young people a space to be expressive and, and, a, and a space where their parents can look up at that stage and, and say, wow, look at my kid, look what my kid is doing. And um, my kids have gone through the programs here and uh, it's, I, I couldn't, you know, I could go on for a long, long time, I won't. But I, I'm, uh, I think what we do with, with children and education and in a variety of ways uh, is just really, really powerful. And um, I think it's the thing that is distinctive from the center now versus when we were founded, when it was really a visual arts organization. And now I think we're, we're as much an education space as we are a, uh, as, as a visual and performing arts space. And we could not do our summer camp programming without our Arts Aspire group. So a lot of times what happens with kids is they get to, get to be 13 or they get into high school and they say, I'm not going to summer camp. I'm not going to take, you know, you know, some camp with third graders or whatever it is. So we created in 2013 our Arts Aspire program. And this is a volunteer program at the entry level of the Arts Ambassadors. And we do about up to about 30 kids a year, uh, ages 14, and then as old as 25 or can be in the program. They volunteer about more than two up two thousand hours of uh, workforce and um, event programming for us, and um, through our funders, we've been able to get um, internship money for students. So um, the past two years, we've had about five interns. Um, a lot of times, it's kids, and one of them told us once, "I didn't want to work in McDonald's, and I got to do something I really loved and get paid for it." And uh, so, Arts Aspire is a program that has three tiers: ambassadors, associates, apprentices, and as kids get into the program and, and stay with it, they move up to that apprentice space and, um, and can get some, some real work site experience in marketing, 
visual arts, education, administrative, and so on. So we're, we're really pleased with that. And these are the kids that helped us in our summer camp this year. All right, that's gonna bring us pretty much to where we are today. Uh, we're really, really very proud and pleased um, in the past year and a half or so, we've gotten a grant from Community Foundation of Broward through its Broward Pride Initiative. And Broward Pride is uh, was created to enhance or create uh, more inclusion and acceptance of the LGBTQ community in Broward. So we applied in 2019 for a grant through Broward Pride. And one of the things was an idea we submitted was to create a film and of coming out narratives. And artists are really using a lot of video now. It's just become just like any of us. We just, everybody's a, a, a you know, a cinematographer these days. So we had designed this idea of having coming out narratives through um, with a visual artist using video. And um, as it turned out, we, um, we ended up really surpassing um, that. It was supposed to be a 10 minute film. It's a 20 minute film. And if I can do this correctly, I am going to show you a trailer. It's about a minute and 30 seconds. So hold on here, bear with me. I did this before, right, Joan? I mean, right, uh, Hannah? That's correct. All right, so I'm gonna stop share and then I'm going to come back here and I am going to uh, share. Oh, are you seeing the same thing? Need to get to my share screen. All right, it looks like I'm I'm not as adept at this as I was when we were practicing. So let's see if I can go back here. Yeah, I'm still doing the same thing. So um, I may try to do that at the end. <laughs> do this. Um, so what what the open dialogues film we exhibited in our um, gallery space. And it became obvious the first night, we had a lot of educators, we had nonprofit leaders, we had uh, government, people in government saying, I would love to show this film uh, to my school, to my nonprofit, to my uh, work staff. So we are currently um, been, uh, presenting a, a series of ongoing screenings. We did two this past week for department leaders in the city of Hollywood. We're doing at ArtServe on October 11th on uh, National Coming Out Day. And then this Wednesday, we're really, really excited uh, to be doing a screening at First Presbyterian Church of Hollywood. Film is 20 minutes. Uh, we'll do a reception at 6.30 and the screening at 7. And that will be followed with um, an interdenominational dialogue with Pastor Kennedy McGowan uh, at First Presbyterian, Rabbi Alan Tufts at Temple Beth El of Hollywood. And then all, it'll be hosted by Todd Delmay of the Hollywood LGBTQ+. Uh, council. So we hope you can attend. I, we, this church has assured us they'll do everything possible to make it comfortable, uh, requiring a mask, opening the doors if necessary to create ventilation and all that. But um, one of the things in the film is uh, among the seven members in the film is really talking about how their connection to Christianity was not served uh, because they've often been ostracized by the church. So I spoke with Kennedy uh, at the church, and he was, he said, I, we, we need to do conversations like this, and uh, he was, he's been great to work with, and I'm really looking forward to having a really an honest discussion about how the church can be in, more inclusive um, to, to the LGBTQ community, and one of the themes in Open Dialogues really is we all have the right to, to be in partnerships and to, to, to be in love, and, um, and I think that's going to be part of um, how the church can maybe in the, our conversation Wednesday, how the church can do a better job of, uh, of including the entire community um, in its services. Uh, coming up this Friday, we have the Exposed Exhibition and Fundraiser. It's our closing night. And if any of you have done Exposed before, you will know you buy a ticket. And on the closing night, we do a, a random draw out of a, out of a bin. And uh, the first name chosen gets to pick any of the works on the wall in the exposed exhibition. And that's their artwork to take home. Uh, if you get picked 56th, you get what's left. Um, I've done it before. I got picked at 54th and uh, got a good work of art. So uh, everything on the walls is, is, is good quality is selected by uh, our curator, Megan Kent. Tickets are 375 for one artwork, 725 for two, 1000 for three. 
And the last I heard, we have a little more than 70 artworks and we're approaching about 60 ticket sales on that. Among the artists, uh, thank you, uh, Hannah, for alerting me. Deborah Perlman, who's a member of the Friends of the Sterling Road Library. And by my count, she's one of 11 Hollywood artists in Exposed. And um, so that represents really um, probably 15% close to 15%, and it, there may be more. Those are the 11 that I know are from Hollywood, and we're really uh, pleased. And it's not they're, not, they're not selected just because they're in Hollywood, they're selected because their work merits being in the exhibition. So that's that's a very high number of, of very you know high quality artists uh, who have been selected uh, for the exhibition who live here in Hollywood. And uh, we are today offering, and this will be my last programming note, um, our uh, Free Arts Family Day. And today the theme is Be a Honey to Bees. It's a steam theme and offered on the third Sunday of every month, free admission. And um, so if you wanna see exposed at no cost today, after we're done here, you can rush on over to the center and, uh, and participate in uh, an art making activity, see the show. And uh, th this has been a really great program. It's a chance for, for parents, uh, grandparents, any caregiver to, Make art with their with their their kids, and um, and it's just really been a really powerful uh, program funded um, by the uh, PNC Arts Alive and an agency grant from the City of Hollywood. All right, so that pretty much catches us up, and now we're going to talk about the future of the City of Hollywood. This is an architectural rendering. Uh, this will be our last slide. This is an architectural rendering of um, the facility that we are in the process of finalizing our architectural drawings for. Uh, this is funded by the obligation bond, the, uh, the GO bond that was passed in 2019. The Art and Culture Center was allocated 2.5 million uh, from that. I think it was a 60, 100 and something million <laughs> dollar bond. I'm drawing a blank on, um, on that, but um, we were included in the uh, sort of the parks and rec uh, area of that. And um, so the striking element here obviously is um, a very modern space in what is now the employee parking lot over closest to the, um, to the Hollywood, uh, to the charter school um, just across the street from us. And, uh, and then maintaining the, the, uh, the look and integrity of the current building. So when I first saw it, I was reminded of a, there's a Cuban phrase my wife repeats now and then, arroz con mango. It's like two things that don't go together. Um, and I think once I kind of wrap my head around it, I, I think it's a really kind of a, a powerful example of, of modernizing our space and at the same time um, capturing two distinct 100 years apart architectural elements. There was no way we were gonna be able to do another building like the one we have. It's, it just it doesn't work. We actually, just to remind everybody, we are operating in an old home and it was a funeral home. It wasn't built for what we do. The new building will be made for our education programming. So we will have a multi-purpose um, room in the front where the, uh, at that front facade, and that will be for dance. Uh, we can do film screenings in there, artist talks, uh, the historical society came in there and wanted to do a talk. That that's the, that that space would be um, usable for that. Uh, if, we will do you have. Wanna, um, I'm I'm sorry to interrupt, but do you want to share your screen? Is there is there? A... Are you not seeing this? No. Mm -mm. Oh no! I'm sorry. Oh, I thought I thought everybody was seeing this. I'm so sorry. I am so sorry. Ay ay ay. Ay, I, I thought I had this. So oh, I'm sorry. I'm. I thought I had. I reshared. Here I am going on and on. Where are we, Joan? I feel like I've lost my um. My connection to you. I'm back on. The only thing you do, you, you're fine, but we just don't see you. You have to push share screen, Jeff. Yeah, but I'm not seeing. I'm only seeing you. I'm not seeing the the entire. We're all. We're all here. Yeah, Don't all, worry about yeah. that. And you're fine. I hit share up here and it's giving me mm -hmm. like a link. I'm so sorry. I thought everybody was seeing what I was talking about. Um, okay, hold on. I know what happened now. Okay. All right. It's bringing me back to my video is why. And I didn't hit that. I'm sorry. I, this is, like I said, this is a little bit um, fresh for me. And let's go back to the PowerPoint. So there we are. Oh, I'm sorry. Thank. I wish. I, yeah, I wish. I'm. I'm sorry. And there we are. Now you're seeing it. 
Okay, I am so sorry. Uh, this was our previous stuff, our open dialogues. I, I, yeah, we got that. We got the exposed. No, no, no. We uh, saw everything. Ex oh, yay. We didn't see that. That's uh, Deborah's work. That's great. Right. Um, that's... Thank you for sharing that. Um, no, yeah, we, yeah. That's about where we stopped, I think. Okay. And then our Free Arts Day, which is going on today. And then here is the rendering that I was saying is a little bit of a shock to the eye, but. Um, and I would love to hear any thoughts, feedback. We're we're um, we're in an advanced stage of sort of finalizing the the details. One of the things we talk about with this space is how we are going to function, the way the two spaces merge. That roof line that comes across the front of our building that sort of is the, the merging point, and that's where our library is. Just uh, where the uh, that there's an opening there between the two buildings that's where the new entrance to the art and culture center will be and we will have a lobby area right there so you'll be able to go to the right you'll go into the arts education building and to the left into the gallery space um, and everything on the interior uh, we will be appropriating the the library space into um, into becoming a greeting area um, so that our front office uh, our front reception area will have a sight line to both spaces um, I was saying that we have the, the dance room and multi-purpose room in the front, visual arts studio um, by that. And we're also uh, putting in a broadcast um, uh, studio and music studio, uh, very small, but with, some, with enough technology for uh, as young people work more and more in, in uh, moving image and sound, uh, we will have a space for that. Space will also have about a 17 or 1800 square foot outdoor courtyard um where you see that little root opening between the two buildings where there are trees that will be a courtyard area and that will be a programming space as well and also just a place where if you come and you just want to go sit outside and drink a bottle of water or just talk with friends uh that space will be available as well so this uh we are on target to hopefully start construction in the latter part of 2023 and then um 2022, I'm sorry, and then um, open in 2023 if we go to plan. So the, we will be distinct in having two adjoining spaces about 100 years apart once we uh, once the new space opens. So that, um, I think that's it for me. And um, yeah, I'll be happy to answer any questions, field any thoughts. Um, we're obviously real keen on getting a sense on how the, the new space um, is looked upon and, and considered. And uh, we, we are, one of the things that, that we are challenged by is as wonderful as our building is uh, currently, everything around us is new. Fort Lauderdale is new, Pembroke Pines is new, Miramar is new, Aventura has new facilities, the new facilities in, in uh, throughout Miami Dade. And we, um, I think for us to continue, and this was the, the case we made to the city, for us to continue to grow and to provide um, programming and, and attract, we, we attract a lot of, uh, of uh, education students from outside of Hollywood, we needed new facility. And uh, the new facility will give us a, a way to um, to compete really and to build. So that's, we're, we're very excited. And, and, you know, if we were doing this privately, it'd probably be built by now, <laughs> but it's a city project and uh, it's city money. And with COVID uh, and, and a lot going on in the construction, it's, it's, it's been a little bit of a slower walk than uh, we had hoped. We'd hoped to be kind of breaking ground by now, but we are on track. So we're pleased to report that. Jeff, thank you so much. Um, one of the, uh, everything you said was so informative. One of the um, aspects of the Art and Culture Center that you didn't mention and for which we are so grateful is the community partnerships that um, your center does uh, as the, co-president of the Friends, I have seen how, what a role, an important role uh, you have played in the lives of our community, whether it's offering classes at the library as part of reaching out to the community by making your space available and 
um, and Megan and Joy being there for us when we did uh, an, an event for our Sterling Circle. You guys have just been fantastic. And we are so lucky to have you in our community. So uh, thank you very thank you. much. One of the things we, we talk about is that if you if you don't have a collaborative, if you're not working collaboratively, you will not, you're not doing, we're not doing our mission for one, but we, we function in a spirit of collaboration and we are, we need to collaborate. Um, we're not a big organization. And so those, that, 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 that ability to partner in and to bring, bring organizations into our space is, is critical to us. And the education, that's one of the things in the growth of our education uh, department, Hannah, is our, our ability to kind of go mobile. We've done classes uh, at, at the um, foster facility Handy. We did something with women in distress up in Deerfield uh, through a grant a few years ago. Um, we go into, go into schools. We do tri-rail fun day when uh, pre-COVID when that was available. So we really do, um, we seek out those opportunities. And if we can if we can partner um, with the, the staff we have, which is not a huge staff, uh, we, we welcome that. So um, people, someone asked, uh, where will the parking be located? And we also had some comments on how wonderful the new space looks. So if you could address the parking issue. So the parking right now, we, um, we used a lot where the new building would go. That's for staff parking, typically during say a, a work day, nine to six, or that some of us are there, some of us are there till seven. Um, those days, the, the traffic is not as much. So if staff parks there, we, we're not, um, I don't think we're not losing any spaces. We're gonna try to add a space or two on that, that space that we currently have. Uh, there's a little bit of street parking in front. One of the things that we are going to be um, working around is the amount of construction that's going to be going on uh, directly across the street from us, uh, Dr. Pedroso's, uh, the pediatrician's office. That apparently is going to be a 10-story space. We know what's happening at Publix, the Planet Publix. We know that the Hollywood Bread Building is is happening. So how that changes the composition of the neighborhood in terms of access points, in terms of street parking, which we currently have across the street or on the street. Um, the only time we're really challenged with parking is like a, an opening event when, you know, we'll put you know, 150 or 200 people in. Um, typically what we have is enough on a Saturday or a Sunday or, an, or on an evening when the entire staff is not there. <clears throat> Oops, I just lost you there. Can you uh, unmute? Oh, Hannah, I missed that. Yeah. I think you, you're muted. Uh, Stacy Adams you. wrote that she learned so much from you today about the whole history and is very appreciative of your, your program. So thank you very much. Susan has a question. Yeah. Uh, first, Jeff, uh, thank you so much. Uh, congratulations on your book and your play and best wishes with that. The PowerPoint was fantastic as a historical document of the history of the Art and Culture Center. And as a new board member of the Hollywood Historical Society, I'm learning so much about historical preservation of everything from documents and photographs to the preservation of buildings. I hope that your PowerPoint, you know, maybe becomes part of uh, our, our archival information because it was so thorough and so rich. You know, we haven't talked about yet how to preserve something as wonderful as that PowerPoint. So it's great. Um, from the photographs that I've seen of the new building, I'm so excited I could scream. And it reminds me so much from the minute I saw it of the Louvre in Paris, the new opening of the Louvre, which isn't so new anymore, is a totally modern glass pyramid structure by I.M. Pei, and it has nothing to do with, you know, the historical um, architecture of the original building. And I thought, my goodness, you know, how cool is it 
that we've um, recognized the architecture of today and matched it up with the architecture from the 1920s. Absolutely brilliant. Well, that, that means a lot. I, I appreciate that. And one of the things I think what it does, it puts into very stark contrast the current building, the KG building. And, you know, to try to replicate that or just to, to imitate it, it would have just looked fake, really. And it would not have been, um, architect Claire is um, uh, Brooks and Scarpa. Um, we're working with an architect named Jeff Huber is the lead architect on that. Uh, he's here in Broward. Um, yeah, so when I first saw it, I thought, okay. And, and then it, I think it really, architects want to do buildings that you notice and you pay attention to. And I, so we knew that as an arts organization, we needed a building that would be distinctive. I think that's one of the cases that was, I'm sure, made when we came to the Keggy home is that this was a really an architectural landmark that needed to be kept, needed to be preserved. And this was a way of giving it new life. Um, so we're going to be able to keep that. And um, the more I look at our building, the more I appreciate these two sort of just diametric worlds that we're going to be operating in. And um, I, I think it works, strangely enough. I think in, in a fun way, it, it works. And one of the things we're really excited about is, as well is having a courtyard space. Um, yeah. So one of the things we, we don't really have where we are now is if you want to go outside and, you know, when it's not a scalding, you know, 104 degrees uh, during those nice months is you have a space to go out and just kind mm -hmm. of recline, check your phone, read a book, just kind of, it, and it diversifies and expands on the visitor experience. If you're dropping your kid off for class or something, you can wait and be in a nice space, go to the exhibition. So, you know, we're, we're really, really looking forward to getting started and um uh but it really is the hard part about these things is the architect will come in and go da -da 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 -da. and we'll go that's beautiful but <laughs> we have to use this space and based on your current design we don't have enough room for blah 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 so we're really down to the minutia of making sure that that something that is visually striking has that the function of our our day to day is 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 kept. Okay, um, that brings us to almost two o'clock. Karen, do you want to close up? Yes, I just want to thank. Can you hear me? I just want to thank you, Jeff. That was absolutely wonderful. A lot of people don't know what a great spot that Art and Culture Center is. So thank you. You did an awesome job. Um, just don't forget, we have our next lecture coming up in October is A Sentimental Journey of Broward County During World War II by Sue Gillis, who's the curator of the Boca Raton Historical Society. So I hope everyone enjoyed this and have a wonderful rest of the day. I have one question for her. If I can be there, I will. But if I can't, um, all these military people <laughs> that came here, I, I grew up playing baseball. Everybody was like a military veteran. And what I learned about Broward County during World War II was that we had the, the airport was military base and that it really became a magnet because the, the weather was good and we had water and da, 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 all those things. Um, what a transformation that the military presence had in the growth of the, and air, I would say air conditioning, automobiles, were the main reasons why we were able to live here. But I think the in the 40s, the more I read, the more the way this becoming a magnet for my, my dad came here, he, en he enlisted in the Marines. He, he was stationed in Opelaka and he looked around and said, I'm gonna go back to coal mining in Pennsylvania. No way. <laughs> and um, and I, I think that's an interesting part of what was going on in the 40s. And uh, I think it was a transformative part. That's a very uh, interesting uh, period, I think, for Broward. Well, Jeff, we expect to see you there. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> for your information, all of our lectures in two days after the lecture occurs, it goes on our our YouTube channel. So, and you can find that either Hollywood Historical Society YouTube channel or it will be on our web page. So right now we probably have two or three years worth of prior ones. Okay. So if you miss it, you can always catch up. I will look for it. And thank you thank again. You. you did an amazing job. Appreciate it very much. Thank well, you, Jeff. Thanks. Have a sorry. 
have a good day. Thanks everyone. to what you do. I really, really do. I'm a, I, I study, I read history and I, I think what, what you do is so important and I'm, I, we're honored to be included. And we feel like we're kind of like a, a cousin sibling because of the, where our building is and how we fit the history now, you know? So thank you. Absolutely. Thank you for joining us. Thank you.